It's on the lesson, ready to print it out. Press the button, one <laughs> print. <laughs> uh, it was out of ink. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, and I uh, uh, fastidiously tore up every other copy before I did it. So <laughs> it made <laughs> it didn't make for a pleasant uh, experience for me anyway. Uh, <clears throat> I want to preach this morning on the idea that there is a spiritual aspect to baptism. Now we all know the physical aspect, but there is a spiritual aspect to baptism. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we just need to ask the question, why should we be buried in baptism? Well, there's a few reason, reasons. The first reason is because Jesus has identified with my death and I ought to identify with his death. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. It's a wonderful chapter, it's lovely. But from verse 4 it reads, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Here was the Christ identifying with my death and my sin on the cross of Calvary. Now there's an opportunity, according to Romans chapter 6 anyway, of me identifying with that death. And let's look at Romans chapter 6 and see what it says in that regard. It says in verse 4, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We're co-buried with him into death. We're co-raised with him from the dead through the glory of the Father, so that we too might walk in this new resurrected life. The second reason why we should be baptized is because we're commanded to be baptized. Jesus sent his disciples into all the world to preach the gospel. And in preaching the gospel, as we know from Mark chapter 16, verse 16, uh, we, they, are, they were to preach the necessity of baptism it says in the, these verses, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who is disbelieved shall be condemned. In Matthew 28, he describes it in these terms. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So what is about to be said to them now is by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ who is above all power and authority in the heavenly realm and he is commanding the apostles go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you and lo I am with you always even to the end of the age. So here's the second good reason why we should be baptized, because we are commanded to be baptized. That's the second good reason. The third good reason is because we are dead in our transgressions and our sins. Remember some of the scriptures that... Um, the show that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. 
Um, first off, let me just say Ecclesiastes 7.20 or point you to that. Indeed, there's not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20. That's just the fact. We've got to accept that. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3 verse 23. We, we have to accept that as a fact. And then the reminder that is made in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 where he's telling the Christians or at least reminding the Christians of the state of affairs that uh, they were in when they first came to the gospel or prior to coming to the gospel. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Why did they need to be buried into the death of Christ? Because they were dead in their transgressions and their sins. We were dead in our transgressions and our sins and we wanted the forgiveness of our sins. Saul is a good example of this. Saul who was later to be called the Apostle Paul. He was still in his sins when he was baptized. Remember he was on his way to Damascus. He was persecuting the church, the Christians. And on his way to Damascus, he meets Jesus. This great light, greater than the noonday sun. And in that part of the world, that really is a great light. It, uh, it floored him. And then he spoke to Jesus, or Jesus spoke to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul asks, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Just imagine the shock that, that, that would have rippled through his whole body. I'm sure he trembled. Both at the appearance and at the voice of God, or Jesus Christ our Lord. And now he's realised that his life has been spent persecuting the, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Saviour of the world. And he's told to arise, go into Damascus, it'll be told you what to do. And he obeys. Now at this point, he's still in his sins. He spends three days in Damascus, fasting and praying. I think this suggests his repentance, his deep and utter humiliation for his sins, because of his sins, and because he persecuted the Lord's people. Ananias was sent to him by the Lord to tell him what to do. So Ananias comes in and he says to him, Now why do you delay? What are you waiting for now? Arise and be baptised and wash away your sins calling upon the name of the Lord. It says he was to get up be baptised. For what reason? To wash away his sins as he called upon the name of the Lord. So, when he believed, or after he believed on the road to, to Damascus, he was still in his sins. When he repented for those three days in agony, he was still in his sins. It was only when he got up and was baptized that he received the forgiveness of his sins and his sins were washed away. So why should we be baptized? For the same reason Paul was, so that your sins can be washed away. That's the identification with the death of Christ. And in that death then we are buried. The physical aspect to baptism is realized in our bodies being buried in water, immersed in water. But the spiritual aspect is realized in our spirit being 
co-buried with Christ in order to be raised up with him to a new life. Colossians chapter 2 verse 12. Let's look there. The Holy Spirit says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, in the interlinear Greek-English New Testament by Nestle and Marshall, they, they translate this burial as a co-burial with him and as a co-resurrection with him. With who? With Christ. We now are identifying with what happened to Christ on Calvary and in the tomb. And we are now being raised to walk in the newness of life just as he came up or came out of the tomb after three days to a new spiritual reality as a human and to glorification. So it will be for us. What God does for us in our identification with Christ's death, burial and resurrection is when you, when you consider it, and we'll see now in a minute where we get the details, is wonderfully merciful and gracious. It abounds with grace. We're baptised to be forgiven of our sins. And I want to use John's baptism... Uh, in Luke chapter 3 verse 3 just to make a point about our baptism and you'll see it now in a minute Luke chapter 3 verse 3 it says and he that is John the Baptist came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins now what I want to ask you is to think about this and answer this question in your mind. If you were a Jew at that time and you heard John preaching a baptism for, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, what would you think you were being baptised for then? The Jew might have thought in his head, as did the Pharisee, well, I've got no sins. Well, then you don't need the baptism. And if you've got no sins, you don't need to be baptized into Christ either, because only sinners need that baptism. But they would have understood it was for the forgiveness of sins. And in illustrating that then, we need just to turn to Acts 2.38 to see that Christian baptism fulfills the same requirement. It says, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's so straightforward. How anybody could misunderstand it or even distort it is beyond me. But they tried our level best to twist it and to break it if they can. But it says that your baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. <coughs> Let us be in no doubt that it is God in Christ who forgives us of all our sins. And that is the way it is in baptism. It's not the water that forgives us of our sins or washes away our sins. It is Christ, God in Christ, who forgives us of our sins. Ephesians chapter 4, 32. He says, 
be kind to one another. He's talking to Christians uh, and he says, Be kind to one another and tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Just a reminder. The fact that God forgives us in baptism should always be a reminder that God has forgiven us our sins. And that we need to continue in that state of grace, so to speak, wherein our sins are continually forgiven. But for the moment, I just want to emphasize that God forgives us of our sins in baptism. He does it through Jesus Christ our Lord and through the sprinkled blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just think about what forgiveness uh, would mean to the sinful woman in Simon the Pharisee's house, Luke chapter 7. Here's this woman coming into the Pharisee's house. She brought, a, brought with her an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind Jesus because they would recline at the table so they're in this position on the floor the feet are behind them their upper body is uh, nearer to the table where they would take the food off the table and eat and so forth so uh, and the houses were open to everybody at the time the Pharisees house they were having the meal but people could walk in and they could stand around and look at what was going on and listen to what was being said and that's what she did, standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing him with perfume. This was wonderful expression of what she thought of Jesus Christ our Lord. She was humbled in his presence. She was exalted from the, the fact that he was... The, the, the Messiah the saviour of the world and she was able to approach him she was able to touch his feet and she didn't want to do any more than, than that she would anoint his feet with, with oil and wash them with her tears and dry them with her hair what, a, what an expression on her part Who, would you do that for anybody? Do that for your husband or your boyfriend. Get lost, you tell me. Of course you wouldn't. Nobody's going to humble themselves in that way anymore in this world. But she humbled herself in the presence of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus makes the comparison between what she did to him or for him and what Simon the Pharisee, who was this religious man, this so-called righteous man did for Jesus, he says in verse 45, you gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Do you think she believed it? I know she believed it. My sins are forgiven. I don't know what sort of a life she had. Um, I think many of the commentators, because of some mistake that the Pope made at one stage, said this is Mary Magdalene. It's not Mary Magdalene. There's no indication that it was. But Mary Magdalene had uh, seven demons cast out of her. This might be a woman of uh, like nature to Mary Magdalene. Obviously, she felt the weight of her sins was so great. And to hear the words, you are forgiven. All of what I've done wrong. All of what I've said wrong. All of the thoughts that I had that were wrong and unrighteous. All forgiven me. That's what it meant to her. So when you were baptized, you were baptized for the same reason. So that that might happen. Your sins, your past sins would be forgiven and removed That's a big blessing. That's an absolutely huge blessing. And David, when he ruminates on this subject, he says, Blessed is the man who sins the Lord will not take into account. Isn't that so true? 
But not only are your sins forgiven, there are other things that are happening. Now, uh, I have to ask myself when I'm uh, doing these other things, these probably all happen simultaneously. <coughs> and I, of course, I have to break it up to give it some order and to present it in a lesson. So, uh, and, and I'm not claiming that this is the exact order that things would be done in. It's a logical order, but uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to happen just one thing after another. It can all happen at once with regard to what God is doing. And that's, he's the one that's doing it here. Um, we move on to what, he, what, el what else he does. Um, Peter, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us, and corresponding to that, he'd just been talking about uh, Noah being saved through the flood, through the waters of the flood. And corresponding to that, he says, baptism now saves you. Listen to that. 1 Peter 3.21 Baptism now saves you. There is so much, so much contention with that. There is not a, a Protestant denomination that will say baptism now saves you. But the Bible says it. The inspired Peter says it. I'll probably say, well, he was a Catholic. <laughs> what would he know? <laughs> what, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm messing here. It, 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 the truth is, he says it. And he says, look, it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh. This is not a bath where, you know, give a bit of a scrub here and there and everywhere and get yourself all nice and clean, get out. It's not a bath in that way. It's, it's more a spiritual event. And this is why we're concentrating on the spiritual aspect of baptism. He says, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God. You're appealing to God for a good conscience. Now, how are you going to get a con good conscience? You can't get a con good conscience with sin on your conscience, with guilt on your conscience. It's impossible. So to have a good conscience, that sin and that guilt and the condemnation has to be removed. But we're appealing to God to do that for us. Where? In baptism. Where he said he'll do it for us. We know this happens in baptism because of what is said in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. I think uh, it would be good for us to read it. If you've got your Bible, just turn over there. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. Uh, maybe you can remember it. Uh, he says, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When your body was washed with pure water, the physical aspect of baptism, your conscience was sprinkled clean by the blood of Christ so that you could be, your sins could be removed, you could be cleansed from all your unrighteousness, and you could have a good conscience in answer to your request that your conscience be good. No more do you have to worry about the sins that you've committed. No more do you have to feel the guilt of those sins that you have committed. No more do you have any condemnation resting on your head because of the sins you've committed. That's what this is all about. If you're in Hebrews, go to chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who had been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? There's the proof that the sprinkling is a sprinkling of the blood of Christ and it will cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The next thing which is associated with it, as I say, uh, this, the, all these things would have happened maybe simultaneously, um, but in, in, in our 
we have in our circumstances we have to uh, take it one by one he also circumcised with a, a circumcised us with a circumcision made, made without hands now the, it's made without hands in that it's not human hands that were involved at all in this it's the divine hands of God that is given uh, that has made the circumcision for us and it's for everybody men and women alike and what does this circumcision involve? It's the removal of the body of flesh. In other words, uh, Romans puts it that uh, you're, you're now dead to the flesh. What, what it's to symbolize is that we are now cut off from the body of flesh. And of course we have to continue to try and put the body of flesh to death after we're baptized. But we're cut off in the baptism. That's cut off from us. It no longer dictates to us what we want, what we are to do, uh, what we like, what, what, uh, where we're going. It, 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 is, it is, instead of it being the controlling factor in our lives as it was before we became Christians or before we were baptized, now it, that power over us is to be broken so that we will be able to walk in the newness of life where we're setting our mind on the spirit rather than on the flesh. There's two passages of scripture. Uh, we're near to Colossians, so let's look at Colossians 2, 11 through 13, where he explains this is all happening in baptism. Colossians chapter 2, 11 through 13. And in him, that's in Jesus, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried, co-buried with him in baptism, in which you were also co-raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. This verse 13 proves also what we were saying, that we were dead in our transgressions and sins when we entered into baptism. And that he would make us alive together with him in baptism, having forgiven us all our sins. Romans 6 verse 6 also supports that statement. Romans chapter 6 verse 6. He says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. That was the point in this removal of the body of flesh so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. I'm tempted to talk about us going back to being slaves to sin and leave it alone. I'm, I'm not on that subject right now. I'm just on baptism. So let's just leave it there. Uh, <clears throat> not only is there a circumcision, but Jesus redeems us and releases us from our sins by paying the ransom price on Calvary, which was his blood poured out so that I might be free of sin and live as a free man before God. It's a lovely statement in Revelation 1 verse 5. It says, I'm from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. So we were released. It's, we were in chains to our sins. We were absolutely like a drug addict, overwhelmed with our cravings and our desires.
that had to be broken. And it was broken. Jesus Christ was able now to redeem us because he had paid a huge price for us uh, when he gave up his life for each one of us. Ephesians 1 verse 7 speaks about this in this way. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. I think when we start to understand the working of God in this situation, and that we begin to link it with the grace which was lavished upon us. Lavished. I mean, this, this, is, not just, uh, this is just not just a measly uh, few bits of grace that God would, would give to us. This was a total commitment to us to be gracious and forgiving and to restore us to a relationship with him in which we would have fellowship together. In him, in Christ, we have that redemption. It's true, his blood, we have the forgiveness of sins and trespasses. And it's according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. It's just wonderful stuff. In Titus 2.14 he says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. We, we remember the children of Israel. We, we, we were talking about it in our study uh, of Exodus. And God redeemed them from Egypt. He delivered them out of the slavery. That is, it, that's that's a, 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 what do you call it, a foreshadowing of our redemption. We are delivered out of our slavery to sin. We're redeemed to be free men and women before our Lord Jesus Christ. We're also redeemed from the futile way of life which we inherited from our forefathers, according to 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. All of those traditions, all of those customs, all of those things that bound us in so many ways to the world and to the flesh and to our ancestors and to, to, uh, to elders and uh, uh, and rulers, all of that, that's been broken for us in God's, in Christ's redemption. We're no longer bound by those things. We're delivered from that futile way of life inherited from our forefathers. Now I'm not saying throw out all customs, but Christians have to be selective. We've, gone, we've got to accept customs, because we have to live in this world, that are consistent with the gospel and reject all others that are inconsistent with the gospel and the spiritual life. That's what we've got to do. To do anything else is to betray Christ and what Christ has done for you. We have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins in Christ, Colossians 1.14. Christ is our redemption. Jesus Christ is our redemption. You're not your redeemer. Christ is your redeemer. You're not your own saviour. Christ is your saviour. Without Christ, we are nothing. Without Christ, we are lost. He is everything to us. He's our wisdom. He's our sanctification. He's our redemption. He's everything to us. And rightly so. The next point is the application of the sprinkled blood also sanctifies us by setting us apart from the world and consecrating us to Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not... Do not be deceived, he says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed. Remember, Ananias said to Saul, 
rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. This washing is baptism. You were sanctified. You were set apart from the world and dedicated to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Sanctified means you became, as you were cleansed of all your sins, you were considered pure. You were considered pure. It's like you have a white shirt and it's all, it's filthy, it's dirty, it's stained by the, the things that you are doing, food and all the messing around that you are doing. It's all, it's filthy. And then you put it in and you do your biological stuff and, and then it comes out white as snow. It's just amazing. Well, here you are as your soul has been purified. And of course, we have to try and keep it pure. But it was purified in baptism through the blood of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins. It's, a, it's just so, so wonderful. And after that then, there was no guilt. We're justified. We're acquitted from all guilt and condemnation. <coughs> and then we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as was promised in Acts chapter 2. Repent and be baptized each one of you for the forgiveness of your sin or for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. If you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, um, he says in verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Here's the promise fulfilled. When does it happen? When we're baptized. When we identify with the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the resurrection, and I'm going to sort of condense this because uh, if I have to fill it out it will take too long. I think I've done enough in that uh, section, early section of the burial section to uh, just convince you of what God is doing for us in this baptism. But uh, in identification with the resurrection of Christ and baptism, we're raised up to a new life. That happens because we had faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead and we believed God would raise us up to a new life with Christ in baptism. Can you see we were dead in our transgressions and sins until we were made alive with him by being raised up to the newness of life? Romans chapter 6 again. In that process we have been born again. Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about being born again. He says you must be born of water and of the spirit in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. In baptism we are born of water and of the spirit in order that we would enter the kingdom of heaven. In Titus 3.5, he calls baptism the labor of regeneration, the bath of regeneration. The regeneration is a new genesis, a new beginning for us, a new life. So in baptism, we put on or clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26, verse 27. You're all sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. You've put on Christ. You've taken off yourself, your old self, your sinful self. But you're not naked. You've put on Christ. In faith, repentance and baptism, we responded to God's invitation to be reconciled to him. Now, see, at Calvary, God reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ our Lord. This, this is a work done while we were still enemies, long before we even existed. This was a work done between Christ and God. God sent him to reconcile us to, him, to himself and there's, there's now an amnesty of peace between us and God. We were enemies of God. God has created an amnesty through the death of Jesus Christ and sends out his emissaries to offer reconciliation to all on the basis of what his son has done us. 
Now we, we of course, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, we are appealed to by the Apostle Paul, I beg you on behalf of Christ, be you reconciled to God. That reconciliation took place in baptism. Romans chapter 5 verse 10. He says, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, and that's where, where it happened in baptism, we shall be saved by his life. In our being raised to a new life, We've entered into a new covenant relationship with God, Hebrews chapter 8, 6 and 7. We are now in a saved relationship and have fellowship with the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord, 1 John 1, 1 through 4. As saved ones, you are added to the body of Christ, Acts 2, 47. You're transferred into the kingdom of heaven, Colossians 1, 13. We're saved from the wrath to come, Romans chapter 5, verse 9. All this became our boon, our, our gift from God as we were raised in baptism from the watery grave. Let's listen to what Jesus had to say in, in John chapter 5, verse 24. In John 5, verse 24, he says this to his audience and to us as well. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. In being raised from the dead to the newness of life, we have this life in Christ Jesus. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. I just want to make a point on this. The only one who possesses eternal life, possesses it, is Jesus Christ our Lord. He's the only one. We come into Christ, and we will have our share in that eternal life in Christ. We won't possess it like him because otherwise we'd be gods. We'd be God, but we share in it. And that's the glory of the new life, the resurrected life, when, whenever we are, uh, are brought out of the graves again and we're pronounced the blessed of the Lord who will come into the eternal kingdom. That's, that's, what, that's, all, that's what that's all about. So, but the life is in the Son. He who has the life has the Son. And as long as you continue to be faithful to the Lord and, and in Christ and remain in Christ, there is no possibility of you losing eternal life. None whatsoever. There's eternal security for you while you remain in Christ. But if you break away from Christ, and many have shown they've broken away from Christ, they've broken away from the body of Christ, then you've broken away from eternal life. Eternal life continues on in Christ, but you have no part in it. That's why when we withdraw from people, they don't understand what they've done. They haven't a clue. They've broken their relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord, and they have separated themselves from the eternal life which is in Christ. They have no part in it until they repent and come back to him. How do we get into Christ? For all of you who have been baptized into Christ. Galatians chapter 3.27. We get into Christ through baptism. And that is why baptism is so important. Because it is at that point. The point of baptism. That God saves you and me through the blood of his son. Jesus Christ our Lord. 
don't know if, I was amazed. I'm, I mean, this has taken a lifetime for me to sort of get this, all this information together. It's been there in bits and pieces, but to put it all together, and now I can see it as, as, a, as a whole picture, so to speak, just amazed of what God did for me in baptism. And there's people in the churches of Christ who are saying, you don't need to be baptized anymore. God, where are we going to? Denying the very thing that God required them to do in order to have all of these great blessings. Brethren, with this understanding, we've got a gospel to preach. Let's preach it and let's live it and prove to people that this is what we believe because it's the word of God. I'll leave it with you. Thank you.